The folks here in Monterey Park that I spoke to were in many ways shocked. Authorities are still gathering evidence on the suspect in this weekend's mass shooting in Monterey Park. That suspect now identified as 72 year old who can Tran. In all, 10 people were killed, five men, five women. Even as we spoke to those reeling from the Monterey Park attack, word came of yet another mass shooting also in California. Here at home to the mass shootings in California, and you'll remember the suspect arrested in that second mass shooting outside San Francisco. We are learning more now about the victims of this tragedy. They include Include Chinese and Mexican immigrants, and two couples are also among the dead. Our crime reporter Henry Lee joins us now in Half the Bay. Two shootings in three days, 19 dead and 10 injured. The shooters, a 72 and a 66 year old Asian American immigrant. What happened? How can a 72 and a 66 year old commit such horrific acts of violence against people they knew, against their own communities? And I know that much of what people talk about in the coming days is gun violence and gun control, which I understand is a part of the conversation. But today, I want to talk about something that is absolutely relevant and absolutely significant to the issue at hand. If we want to prevent future tragedies such as these, we have to talk about this one thing. And in order to do so, we have to turn the clock back to April 16th, 2007. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Wallace with First Look for this Monday. It is an incredibly busy time here in this newsroom as we are all pulling together to cover what is turning out to be the deadliest campus shooting in U.S. history. At this afternoon hour, at least 30 people believed to be killed on the campus of Virginia Tech. The deadliest school shooting in the U.S. The shooter, Sung Hee Cho a 23-year-old Korean-American immigrant, a student at Virginia Tech University who terrorized and killed 32 students and faculty at the school. I remember this tragic incident very clearly because I was a student in Korea at the time. In Korea, being a country of strong collectivism, there was a national sense of public shame and embarrassment because the perpetrator was Korean. And I remember there was quite a bit of conversation about his family, mental health, assimilating to U.S. culture as an immigrant. This was a big deal, obviously here in the U.S., but I remember it being a big deal in Korea as well. And that's when I realized that mental health in immigrant communities is seldom talked about. But that's actually not what I want to talk about today. And hear me, we're getting there. After the Virginia Tech shooting, there was actually an official report of several hundred pages. And it detailed the shooter's mental health issues dating all the way back to when he was a child. And now, it's been almost 16 years. So where are we with all that? As an immigrant myself, I can speak from personal experience, but studies also show that immigration-related stressors can lead to a host of psychological issues. Because adapting to a new culture, often being marginalized and misunderstood, and even generational conflict with parents can all be incredibly traumatic. And hear me, I'm not saying that these recent shootings were the result of psychological disorders because we just don't know yet. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they were. But my biggest problem with this conversation of mental health in immigrant communities is that the people who can have real meaningful impact seem to just not want to. You see, immigrants face challenges specific to language and cultural barriers. And those challenges often become barriers to the very access or the very care of mental health issues. And that finally leads us to the topic that I actually want to talk about today. Medical licensing. 
And some of you are now confused. You're like, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Well, to get there, we have to turn the clock back even more to the 1800s. You see, medicine in the 1800s was like the wild, wild west. Most of the doctors during that century weren't even licensed. There were doctors who practiced Western medicine, but there were also many who practiced alternative medicine, and some not even medicine. Look, the precursor to medicine is essentially the practice of healing. So there were clairvoyant, people who claimed to heal with psychic powers, homeopaths, osteopaths, magnetic healers, and the list goes on and on. Well, in order to curb fraudulent medical practices, in 1847, the American Medical Association, or AMA, was created. They wanted the practice of medicine to be regulated by every state. And with their lobby, states started to pass laws to make sure, well, that people who claimed to be doctors were actually doctors. Of course, change wasn't easy at first and there was plenty of pushback. For example, in 1989, there was even a court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Dent v. West Virginia. Frank Dent, who had been practicing medicine for six years, sued West Virginia when the new regulations didn't allow him to keep practicing because his education was considered not legitimate. Well, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that states did have the authority to regulate medicine. Fast forward to today, now you have medical licensing boards in every state regulating the practice of medicine as well as medical education. Now, I think everybody will agree that protecting the public from fraudulent doctors is a good thing. I mean, I definitely think so. But critics of licensing boards argue that it was never about protecting the public, but rather about eliminating competition, essentially creating a monopoly and making sure doctors made a ton of money by reducing the supply of doctors. Remember, there were many different kinds of medicine and I'm not saying that all of them were legitimate, but what I am saying is that there could have been a group of doctors with a particular kind of education who came together and said, wouldn't it be nice if it was just us? Now, that was a long time ago. What does that have to do with today? Am I saying that if we had psychic doctors, somehow we would be in a better position? No, I'm not saying that. But what happened back then is happening today. And it's actually hurting people, not helping them. You see, current regulations make it very difficult for doctors overseas to come practice in the U.S. Often, they require doctors to redo their residency all over again, which is like a four to five year long process. And I get that these regulations are there to protect the public, but are these licensing boards doing just that? Or are they protecting the self-interest of their Co-worker. And I also understand that different countries have different standards of care and requirements and whatnot, but do they really? Because doctors collaborate at the international level all the time. We saw that with COVID. And regardless of which country you're from, if you've been practicing medicine for 10, 20, 30 years, that's gotta count for something. So the idea that a doctor with decades of experience would have to redo their four-year-long residency in order to practice in the U.S. is absolutely ridiculous. And this affects immigrant communities in the U.S. Remember that I said that immigrant communities have language and cultural barriers when it comes to mental health resources and care? Well, how do you overcome that? By importing expertise from overseas. The reality is they are highly trained, and highly experienced mental health professionals overseas who speak the language and know the culture of those in immigrant communities right here in the U.S. But because medical licensing boards continue to insist on protecting the monopoly of their own, whether intentionally or not, those people 
can't help at all. And this is especially a problem with the growth of telehealth. Technology continues to eliminate the physical distance between people. And now, patients can literally talk to a doctor on the other side of the world without having to travel. So why not let them see doctors via video conferencing? I just hope that medical licensing boards will keep up with the time. Technology is advancing at a rapid pace and leveraging new technology could help a lot of people everywhere. So instead of protecting a monopoly, I hope we can start to actually care about the public. I mean, mental health is a serious issue and more and more people are recognizing that. And I just hope that people in immigrant communities aren't just left behind. This is a country of immigrants. So instead of just pounding the table and demanding that people conform, I just hope that we can help each other have an easier time becoming an American, whatever that means. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please subscribe, uh, click on the bell, and like this video, share it with whoever you think this video would be valuable. Hopefully this adds a little bit to the conversation. Um, yeah, so I'll talk to you later.